Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Thursday, January 9th, 2020, and we are live. And I wanted to deal with this topic. I ran out of time on my Sunday night show, uh, the January 5th, 2020 edition of the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. And we broadcast here on Facebook Live also. I touched on this topic a little bit, but there was more information that I had that I did not get a chance to get to. So um, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in and African-American business owners post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. So every New Year's Day, and you may, may have done this this past New Year's Day, right? In African-American households, they eat black eyed peas. And I remember when I was a kid, my mother would cook black eyed peas for New Year's Day, and it was a tradition. And she said this to bring good luck for the new year, right? So it was something that we did, but I didn't know why we did it besides <laughs> mama's, besides my mother saying, oh, we're going to eat black eyed peas, right? But I didn't know why we did it. But there's a tradition behind this. So I, I, I want to talk about this. Why do African-Americans eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day? And then also in, in doing research on this topic, um, I came across uh, additional information dealing with um, American foods that we did not know that were actually African foods, okay? And this deals with understanding the transatlantic slave trade. And during the transatlantic slave trade, it was not just Africans who were brought from Africa, but it was, it was also food brought from Africa to America, which also changes America and changes the palates, changes the taste of white Americans as well, all right? Okay, so how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on the Facebook page. Then um, also uh, follow us here on the Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. And on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And uh, you can donate to The African History Network as well, paypal.me forward slash The A-H-N Show. And then also on Cash App, uh, dollar sign The A-H-N Show on Cash App. All right, so, um, the, one of the first articles I saw dealing with this for 2020 was from the Columbus Dispatch, okay, dispatch.com. Black eyed peas reach deep into African American tradition. Black eyed peas reach deep into African American tradition. And I've been looking at articles from the LA Times, Washington Post, Atlanta Journal Constitution. There have been a number of articles written about this tradition. Also, blackpast.org has an extensive article dealing with um, African foods. Uh, how do they put it? Uh, transatlantic food migration, the African culinary influence on the cuisine of the Americas. It's a very deep, uh, it's like eight or nine pages, very deep article, which deals with how African slaves, because they're the ones cooking the food, and because there are also foods brought from Africa, African slaves are changing the taste of their slave masters, okay? Not, not just the foods that they're cooking and foods they're bringing from Africa, but also the spices, the way they season the food as well. And we, we see this also in fried chicken, okay? So there's a deep history behind all of this. All right, so if we look at this article from uh, the uh, Columbus Dispatch, and let me pin this information here also, okay. If we look at this uh, article from the Columbus Dispatch, uh, it talks about uh, uh, black eyed peas reach deep into African American tradition. And one of the things it talks about in the article is um, the first big meal of the new year with a pot of black eyed peas uh, at its center is deeply entwined with African American culture. Now, Jessica B. Harris is a food historian, and she was also cited in an article I read from National Geographic dealing with African foods that we thought were American foods. But just, uh, food historian Jessica B. Harris said, eating black eyed peas on New Year's Day has been done by black Americans to ensure good luck in the incoming year. 
Um, and she fondly recalled attending the lively New Year's Day party Maya Angelou held at her home in Harlem, Harlem, New York, where Black Eyed Peas were served. Um, Jessica, Jessica B. Harris said, this tradition carries over from the Black American community into the general Southern community in many places and persists in the North as well as a result of the Great Migration. So the, the Great Migration is going to change this country. And it's important to understand the Great Migration is basically from uh, 1915 to about 1970. Six million African Americans migrate from the South, up North and out West. Prior to the Great Migration, basically 90% of African Americans lived in the South as a legacy of slavery, 246 years of slavery. Okay, so Black Eyed Peas were domesticated in West Africa and carried to the South and the Caribbean in the era of slavery. Uh, food historian Jessica B. Harris said, uh, dried legumes were looked down on as a poor man's food, but the economic scarities of the Civil War severely impacted the diets of both enslaved Africans and white Southerners. So when we look at the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, the, the South is going to be destroyed because of the Civil War. Plantations set on fire, bridges knocked out. All different types of things like this. The, 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 the South is in, the South is, is uh, um, in, uh, the South is totally, uh, was largely destroyed, not totally destroyed, largely destroyed. This is why you need a reconstruction to reconstruct the South. But one thing that oftentimes is not focused on when we look at the, what's known as the Freedmen's Bureau, the Bureau of Freedmen, the, the, U, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees and Abandoned Lands. We know they were providing services to the formerly enslaved Africans, the, the black freedmen. They were helping them find lost loved ones and put the family back together. They were helping them get married. They were helping them do things like uh, they were helping them uh, put money in banks, all different types of things like this. But the Freedmen's Bureau was also helping destitute white people because a lot of poor whites were you, a lot, you have poor whites who worked on plantations. They may have been overseers, things like this. Well, when the plantations are destroyed, what have you, the enslaved Africans are set free. They're out of jobs. So you had a lot of poor, destitute white people as well. If you watch the original Roots, came out in 1977, Roots, Alex Haley's Roots. In the later episodes, after, uh, after slavery ends, there was the... Um, fictitious white family of George, a white, they called him White George because they had a, a George who was the son of Chicken George. And then the other George, they called him White George, White George and, and his wife. And they were destitute. And he comes, he comes uh, to uh, uh, George's uh, house. These are former, the, the black people are former slaves. And he's begging for food. And then while he's sitting there eating, he says, you know, his wife was outside, she's pregnant, so the former slaves bring them in and feed them also, right? You had a lot of destitute white people that oftentimes is not, oftentimes are not talked about. So the um, Black Eyed Peas were domesticated in West Africa and carried to the South and the Caribbean in the era of slavery. Uh, dried lagoons were looked down on as poor, as a, as poor man's food but the economic scarcities of the Civil War severely impacted the diets of both enslaved Africans and white Southerners. Black Eyed Peas became more common, and it is said people considered themselves fortunate to eat them during a time rife with food insecurity, okay? So because of a time of, of poverty, people going hungry, things like this, you have people who consider themselves fortunate to be able to have black eyed peas, but black eyed peas are coming from West Africa. Black eyed peas are an African food. Though, um, so they talked about, um, uh, previously in the article, they talked about uh, Mashama Bailey. And uh, Mashama Bailey is a chef, uh, a chef. And about 10 years ago, Mashama Bailey asked her maternal grandmother, Geneva West of Forsyth, Georgia, to serve black eyed peas with ham hocks and collard greens on New Year's Eve. Um, Mashama Bailey 
was returning to New York City where she lived and wanted to have that symbolic meal before she left that day. And um, her, her grandmother uh, suggested, uh, her, her grandmother suggested her reluctance to serve the dish before New Year's Day, but um, uh, Geneva West uh, ultimately agreed, okay? So uh, though Bailey's family uses ham hocks in his black eyed peas, she opts for a vegan approach that produces a clean, pure pea flavor, PEA, it also allows her version to be enjoyed by those who don't eat meat, okay? So I don't eat meat. So when I cook black eyed peas, I ain't have black eyed peas New Year's Day, I guess I need, I need to have some, right? But I don't put meat in it, okay? But ham, putting ham hocks in it, that's something I guess that we get from slavery, all right? Uh, some of us are vegans or vegetarians and don't, don't mess with meat. So we see this tradition practiced by African-Americans across the country, not just in the South, across the country on New Year's Day, and, the, and there are variations of it also. So Atlanta Journal-Constitution has, uh, has an article because some people eat collard greens along with black eyed peas. Also, other people, also some people eat cornbread, okay? And eating peas is uh, eating round food, eat the different types of peas is associated with coins, which is money. Eating cornbread, corn is yellow, is associated with gold, okay? So both of these deal with prosperity. So Atlanta Journal-Constitution has an article, this is why we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day. This is why we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day from uh, Stephanie Toon, T-O-O-N-E. This is from December 31st, 2019. And in this article, um, the uh, talk to uh, the, the, the reference researcher, John uh, Egerton, who wrote the book, Southern Food at Home on the Road in History. And the article says a few culinary experts have some clues how this tradition came to be. Talking about um, eating uh, black eyed peas and collard greens, okay, on New Year's Day. And we see this uh, a lot in the South and as Southerners go uh, migrate throughout the uh, United States, they take this with them. And John Egerton said, black eyed peas are associated with a quote, mystical and mythical power to bring good luck, end quote. So when I look at different sources for this, black eyed peas are associated with prosperity and good luck. Now, according to a report by Southern Living, the black eyed peas have um, that lucky reputation reaching all the way back to 500 AD as a part of the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. Now, in an, um, in an article from USA Today, Linda Palacio, P-E-L-A-C-C-I-O, who is the host of a culinary radio show called A Taste of the Past, Linda Palacio said that peas and other lentils are associated with the holiday, okay, Rosh Hashanah. Eating them along with collards with their green color represent a financially prosperous new year, okay? So eating lentils, whether you talk about black eyed peas, other types of lentils, along with collard greens that are green are associated with a financially prosperous new year. If we look at the article from USA Today, let me pull this up. The article from USA Today that they cite is from December 31st, 2019. It's called Eating for Luck on New Year's. Why Foods from Grapes to Peas Promise Prosperity. Eating for Luck on New Year's. Why Foods from Grapes to Peas Promise Prosperity. Okay. And we'll post the, um, I'll post the links to these articles here in the thread of the broadcast when we're done. All right, how's everybody doing? African-American business owners posting, be speaking of prosperity, right? African-American business owners post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Then also you can donate to um, the African History Network that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, broadcast our Sunday night show, pay the bills, et cetera. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. 
uh, through PayPal or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. All right, uh, let's continue here. Okay, all right, so when we look at this article here from um, uh, USA Today, let me flip back over to it. Okay, eating for luck on New Year's, why foods from grapes, grapes to peas promise prosperity. Um, they talk about peas and lentils, peas and lentils. Round foods resemble coins and money, okay, um, Linda Palacio uh, says. Eat these symbolic foods, many believe, for a financially successful new year. On the contrary, don't eat the round foods and you could have a year of bad luck, okay? If you eat peas with greens and cornbread, peas with greens and cornbread, that, uh, then that's even more auspicious. What with green being the color of money and cornbread calling to mind gold? Black eyed peas are served with rice in the traditional Southern U.S. dish called Hoppin' John, H-O-P-P-I-N apostrophe, Hoppin' John, J-O-H-N. So I was looking at articles from Washington Post, things like this. So I keep seeing this dish, Hoppin' John. Now, I didn't know, know about Hoppin' John. You know, my parents are from the South, but, you know, you know, I, I ain't never ate, ate chitlins. And my mother ate chitlins because she did that down in Tennessee. I had never eaten a chitlin. I had not eaten a chitlin to save my life. Uh, but, you know, anyway, so... Black eyed peas are served with rice in the traditional Southern U.S. dish called Hoppin' John for New Year's Eve. Or the peas can be part of a soup. In Italy, lentils mixed with pork for a lucky dish. So there's also a tradition of eating 12 grapes. Okay, now I didn't know, I didn't know about this. And this is um, practiced among uh, his, the Hispanic community, all right? As the tradition goes, believers eat 12 grapes at midnight, one grape for each month of the year. According to one story, the ritual started in Spain around the year 1900 when a grape grower had a bumper crop, okay, said Linda Palacio, and was creative about giving away the surplus. But that history is fuzzy at best, she says. Regardless, stuffing a dozen grapes into one's mouth is a tradition that has spread to citizens of many Latin American countries, okay? People annually eat the grapes, quote, as fast as physically possible without puking, end quote, all right? So I had never heard of that tradition. But, you know, in, in researching this, the traditions that different people have, different cultures have in different, different countries for... New Year's Eve, New Year's Day to bring prosperity and good luck in the new year. Um, and there's also tradition about pork, tradition about noodles, things like that as well. So uh, there's a lot. Check out, check out this article here from, uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, check out this article from USA Today. Eating for luck on New Year's, why foods from grapes to peas promise prosperity. We'll post this link here on the thread of the broadcast here. Uh, we have Kenya, Donita. How you doing, Donita? Uh, Maurice. Uh, there's a few of the people watching. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in all social. It's on the social media platforms as well, YouTube, etc. We've got, uh, okay, Donita, Maurice, uh, Portia, Jeffrey, Charlotte. Uh, who else? Uh, got, got a Dennis. Just a few of the people watching. All right, let's continue here. So, okay, that's the USA Today article. Now, black eyed peas in the South, we go back to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution article, right? Uh, black eyed peas in the South. Though its roots do not stem from the South, eating black eyed peas in particular dishes has become a Southern tradition, uh, Linda Palacio said. Black eyed peas are served with rice in the traditional Southern U.S. dish called Hoppin' John. This is another reference to Hoppin' John from New Year's Eve. Or the peas can be part of a soup. In Italy, lentils mixed with pork for a lucky dish. That tradition of eating the peas with rice is of African origin. That tradition of eating the peas with rice is of African origin. 
and it became popular in the South later, especially in the Carolinas, because we know a lot of Africans were taken into the Carolinas. Now, other Black IP, uh, Black IPs combinations. Black IPs peas with cornbread represents gold, according to Southern Living. Stew your Black IPs peas with tomatoes, and they become a symbol of wealth and health. One unusual but common New, Year, New Year's Day Black IP peas tradition involves putting actual money in the dish. Now, I never heard of that before. You know, I did. A, I learned some things. <laughs> I learned some things doing research. Now, I knew about different foods. I knew about some foods that were actually African foods that became American, but um, I learned some things in doing research on this also. Some people add, uh, so one unusual but common New Year's Day Black Eyed Peas tradition involves putting actual money in the dish. Some people add to their luck by cooking their pot of peas with a penny or dime inside. Whoever gets the bowl with the coin in it, according to legend, has the best luck for the new year. I hope they don't swallow the dime or the penny because they, they're going to have to go. <laughs> they're going to go to the hospital or something like that. You know, uh, so it's not going to be too lucky if they swallow the dime or the penny. All right. Uh, but check out this article from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. This is why we eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day by Stephanie Toon, T O O N E. All right. Now, um, there was a really good article from National Geographic. And this deals with African foods you thought were American, African foods you thought were American. Okay. And let me see. I want to make sure I'm not skipping over uh, some of the, oh, LA Times had a, had a good article for many black families, New Year's greens and black eyed peas fill the belly and soul. Uh, this is from January 1st, 2020 uh, from uh, LA Times. Let's see. Okay, and they talk about uh, Hop and John again in, in, in this article as well. All right, so that's one you can, there's a lot of anecdotes in that one. But this is um, this one from National Geographic. It's a really good historical article. Five African foods you thought were American. Five African foods you thought were American. Uh, it's likely that something you ate or drank today was first brought to North America by slaves. Now, this is from September 21st, 2016 by Catherine Zuckerman. And um, in the article, it talks, it talks about the um, opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And there are nearly 37,000 objects that will go on display in collections that range from clothing and communities to segregation and slavery, stitching together a tapestry of suffering, triumph, triumph and tradition. Some of these artifacts, like an oyster basket, oyster bas basket used by African American oyster oystermen, and a large stock pot that was once used for cooking collard greens at DC's famed Florida Avenue Grill, will be part of an exhibit that looks at African American foodways across three distinct regions: the agricultural South, the Creole Coast, and the North. The museum's restaurant, Sweet Home Cafe, will focus on ingredients and dishes specific to these regions, plus one more region called the Western Range, with offerings like shrimp and grits, uh, the Creole Coast, buttermilk fried chicken, agricultural south, oyster pan roast in the north, and son of a gun stew in the Western Range. Now, uh, the spoke with Jerome Grant. Jerome Grant is an executive chef at, uh, at the Sweet Home Cafe. And he said, each of the four regional stations demonstrate the migration of African-American people and culture through foodways. Indeed, many of the fruits, vegetables, and legumes we now take for granted came to the United States from Africa through the transatlantic slave trade. And the different foods, they, they have a map here, the different foods they refer to are black eyed peas, coffee, cola nuts, okra, watermelons, um, and they show different coffee trade routes and slave trade routes. So let me see, let me turn on the screen share, see if I can show you this as well, because 
oftentimes when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade and, and, and I do uh, an online class dealing with the transatlantic slave trade, um, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. A lot of times we talk about the, um, uh, we, we'll talk about the uh, human cargo, the, the African bodies, African people were taken out of Africa but we don't talk about the intellectual capital that was taken out, the scholars, the attorneys, the physicians, okay, doctors, scientists, teachers, things like this, right? But there were mathematicians, but there were agriculturalists. There were uh, those who uh, herded animals, those who worked with animals, but there were also farmers, there were agriculturalists. And then the Africans who had expertise in planting crops and cooking food and all different types of things like this. So that intellectual capital was brought to this country. And then you're going to have African foods that are brought here as well, because you have, um, when you have um, uh, enslavers on the slave ships, they're, when, when they're uh, by Africans or what have you, or trading, however they're doing this, it, it varies from place to place. They're also getting food as well. They're also getting foods. And then also in the Caribbean, they're going to do the same thing in the Caribbean. And some of those Africans are going from Africa to the Caribbean and then coming here as well. Okay, so if we look at this quickly here, and let's see if we can zoom in. Okay, African food routes to North America. Before they became staples to North America, many African foods made their way over via the transatlantic slave trade between the 16th and 19th century, so the 1500s to 1800s. With coffee taking the most circuitous route, coffee taking the longest route, so it's a little faint. But we see Angola, let me see if you see the pointer here. We see Angola and we see them coming from Angola because Africans didn't just come from West Africa. They're taking Africans from Angola, from Congo, different, different places like that. And they're coming to the U.S. About 20% of African Americans have ancestry to go back to Angola and the Congo. They're taking them from West Africa, Senegal, Ghana, uh, Mali, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, things like this, right? So we look at the routes and we see them going into, um, going into like the Caribbean. We see them going uh, here on the East Coast. Um, coming from these areas, coming from Senegal, Sierra Leone, coming from Guinea, coming from um, coming uh, this is for coming from Ghana, all this we see them going into these routes here, going into uh, the Carolinas, going into these areas here in the east, and then we see uh, coffee, okay. We see coffee coming from, uh, looks like Ethiopia, and then going through Europe, coming to the East Coast. I'm not exactly sure where that is on the East Coast, what state that is, what colony then state. Okay, so if we look at this here, but you can check out this, we'll, we'll post a link to this article, you can look at this more in depth. All right, so if we look at this, among the most important of these, says African-American foodways author and scholar, Jessica B. Harris, once again, just Jessica B. Harris, who um, was cited in the article from the Columbus Dispatch. Among the most important of these, says African-American foodways author and scholar, Jessica B. Harris, whose research helped shape the Sweet Home Cafe menu are black eyed peas, okra, watermelon, cola nuts, and coffee. Now UCLA professor of geography, Judith Carney, C-A-R-N-E-Y agrees. In her book, In the Shadow of Slavery, Africa's Botanical Legacy in the Atlantic World, B-O-T-A-N-I-C-A-L, botanical, dealing with flowers, plants, things like this. Judith Carney in, in her book outlines the origins and trajectories of each of Africa's major native crops that were brought over to the U.S. on slave ships. 
She said, the story of African crops is little known and poorly understood. To look at these plants is to engage the organization of the slave trade as corridors for the diffusion of African plants to the Americas. To look at these plants is to engage the organization of the slave trade as corridors for the diffusion of African plants to the Americas, end quote. Now, the article goes on to say, after all, how often do we consider when selecting the ripest melon for our summer fruit salad or ordering a cafe latte with breakfast that these things originated and flourished on a completely different continent? Even more important, uh, how, how often do we consider that it was an enslaved plant, uh, enslaved population that brought them here? Now, it doesn't help that white Southern chefs often receive credit for showcasing certain quote unquote heritage food on their menus without noting that they're actually native to Africa. So then they give an example of Paula Dean. Now we remember Paula Dean, the, the Southern cooking comfort food, Southern cooking chef, right? And she, I think she had a TV show. She, you would see her on TV shows. And then, um, uh, in 2013, you know, she admitted to using racial slurs, right? So, you know, Paula Dean was from Albany, Georgia, and she built an empire around her brand of Southern cooking, okay? Now, the African American Museum aims to change uh, this understanding of, of food and, and foods that Africans brought to this country by helping quote all Americans see how their stories, their histories and their cultures are shaped and informed by global influences, end quote, according to the um, museum's website. Now in that spirit, uh, they go on to list five foods that are African that we associate with American. We don't know that they're African. First, we have the cola nut or cola nuts which come from West Africa called Cola Natida, N-I-T-I-D-A. And um, let's see, who is this? Uh, Judith. Judith Carney said that two of the most widely consumed beverages in the world today are based wholly or in part on plants ancient Africans domesticated, on plants ancient Africans domesticated. One of these plants is the cola nut whose level of caffeine considerably exceeds that of coffee, okay? And uh, uh, the cola nut was once a key ingredient in Coca-Cola, all right? This comes, from, this comes from Africa. This comes from West Africa. Slaves used, enslaved Africans used the uh, cola nuts to freshen the fetid, F-E-T-I-D, water, available on the ships on their voyages across the Atlantic, which un undoubtedly contributed to the early presence of the cola nut in New World Plantation Societies, uh, Judith Carney said. Then we have okra. Now, I'm not a big fan of okra because it's slimy, um, but okra comes from West Africa as well, okay? Hibiscus, uh, escalent, es Escalentus, E-S-C-U-L-E-N-T-U-S. She said, wherever okra points its green tip, Africa has been. Wherever okra points its green tip, Africa has been. Uh, this is what uh, Jessica Harris said. And the, uh, she said, quote, in the South where enslavement lasted longer, and climate made Africans and their descendants most at home. It is uh, revered and treated with respect. It's an ingredient in the Southern succotashes of many states and reigns supreme in many of the gumbos of New Orleans and Southern Louisiana. Southerners just seem to know or perhaps have learned from African-Americans how to savor the slippery juice that the tender pods exude when they are cut, end quote, okay? So okra comes from West Africa. I'm not a fan of okra. You can, you can have my serving of okra. Uh, 
Then we have watermelon. Okay, now I like watermelon. Uh, watermelon comes from Africa. The region is unknown. And I, I've seen some different articles talking about the origins of watermelon as well. The, the ancestor of the watermelon we know today first grew in Africa. But its prototype was originally a bitter melon that was grown on arid savannas for its edible seeds and as a storable form of moisture, okay, Judith Carney said. Um, and they referenced the 5,000 year secret history of watermelon, okay, the 5,000 year secret history of watermelon. Um, this is another article from National Geographic from August 21st, 2015. Uh, let's see here. Hold on. Let's see. What is this doing? Okay. Just a second. It's asking for my email address again for some reason. Okay. Uh, ancient Hebrew texts and Egyptian tomb paintings reveal the origins of our favorite summertime fruit. So when, when, you, when you start studying the, the history of foods like this, I mean, this history is deep. This takes you back hundreds of thousands of years. So in this article, um, let's see, let's scroll down here. All right, so they talk about... Um, uh, a pharaonic fruit, and they say people have been eating watermelons for millennia. We know this because archaeologists found watermelon seeds along with the remnants of other fruits at a 5,000-year-old settlement in Libya. Okay, so 5,000 years ago, Libya was black, all right, for people that don't know. Seeds as well as paintings of watermelons also have been discovered in Egyptian tombs built more than 4,000 years ago, including King Tut's, okay? One tomb painting in particular stands out. The watermelon depicted in the image is not round like the wild fruit. Instead, it has the now familiar oblong shape, suggest suggesting that it was a cultivated variety. A fair question to ask is why the Egyptians or the Kemet or the Kemites or the Kemet too, because Kemet, K-E-M-E-T is one of the original names what we call Egypt. Kemet means the land of the blacks. A, a fair question to ask is why the Egyptians began cultivating wild watermelons in the first place. The fruit was hard and unappetizing, tasting either bitter or bland. Yet somebody at some point said, hey, let's grow more of these. To an uh, the answer, uh, is in the fruit's name, water. Unlike other fruits, watermelons could remain edible for weeks or even months if kept in a cool shaded area. A National Geographic correspondent visiting Sudan in 1924 saw watermelons being collected and stored this way during the dry season when they would be periodically pummeled to, act, to extract their water. Okay, and then they cite... Um, who is this uh, uh, Paris, last name Paris, Harry Paris, okay? Um, Harry Paris is a horticulturalist at the, agricultural, at, at the Agricultural Research Organization in Israel. And Harry Paris has spent years assembling clues, including ancient Hebrew texts, artifacts in Egyptian tombs, and medieval illustrations that have enabled him to chronicle the watermelon's astonishing 5,000 year transformation. So there's a, there's a deep history behind these foods. So when, you know, I did a, I did a video, I think I'm gonna have to do it again because it was on my old laptop and um, this laptop has a much better camera on it. Um, I did a video dealing with how watermelons became a racist trope, how watermelons became negative for African-Americans because for some African-Americans during slavery, we would plant watermelons and we were allowed to plant watermelons. And for some of us, we could sell them and, and make some money even during slavery. 
it, it, we may be enslaved, but we can still plant watermelons and either share what we, for some of us, we could uh, uh, sell the watermelons, make some money, share some of the money with the slave owner, what have you. Uh, but after slavery ends, when you're going to have black freedmen, former slaves who own land, watermelon was one of the crops that we grew because we had experience growing watermelon and this experience growing and this experience growing watermelon is ancient. But when we, when we, but when we were free and growing raw watermelon, then watermelon became looked at white people associated that as being something negative because we're free and we're growing watermelons and we can make money off of it. And watermelons for us was a sign of independence. It, it was a sign that you own land, you could grow this crop, you can make money. So watermelons for us after slavery became a sign of independence, but there's, a, there's an ancient history and ancient African history to watermelons as well. Um, let me see some, let me see if I could pull up one of these articles that I dealt with dealing with um, watermelons. Uh, yeah, the Atlantic.com has a good article, How Watermelons Became a Racist Trope. How, there's a number of articles I read dealing with this, but the Atlantic.com has one, um, How Watermelons Became a Racist Trope. Yeah, and so 1916, you have the um, you have the the guy you have the singer Harry C. Brown, 1916. He records a song for Columbia Records called "N Word Love a Watermelon." Ha ha ha! That was the name of the song. Because what we're going to see is in the early 1900s, we're going to see these these uh, these caricatures of African Americans eating watermelon watermelon and it being something negative. We also see this depicted in the 1915 movie, The Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith, which um, all the negative racist stereotypes of African-Americans were depicted in this movie and they showed them eating watermelon, things like this, right? So there's a whole, there's a whole history of how this 5,000 year old African fruit that African people had been eating for 5,000 years, how this gets transformed into something negative and races and part of menstrual shows, things like this, right? Um, but but Harry C. Brown writes, uh, he, he sings this song and it becomes, it's a big hit, 1916. This is during uh, the, the beginning of the Great Migration. This is um, during World War One, And the song is on YouTube. You just Google N-word level watermelon, ha, ha, ha. You can listen to the song. The song took the tune from a old uh, folk song called Turkey in the Straw. Turkey in the Straw, I think it was called. And that tune from Turkey in the Straw and Harry C. Brown's song is, is a popular song that's still played on ice cream trucks today. There was a uh, article from NPR.org. NPR.org had an article uh, dealing with how the um, famous, what is this called? Re okay. I talked about this on my show man, back in like 2014 when this article came out. Recall that ice cream truck song, we have unpleasant news for you, okay? Recall that ice cream truck song, we have unpleasant news for you. So then it goes in, in, into this history of um, going from the minstrel shows in the uh, late 1800s to the ice cream trucks in the early 1900s, from the minstrel shows to the ice cream parlors to the ice cream trucks going into people's neighborhoods, playing music from a previous generation, right? And, 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 and tapping into that nostalgia and, and playing music associated with minstrel shows. All right, there's a deep history behind all of this stuff. 
Um, let me see. Let's pull this up on other computers, see if we can play this song here. So when you hear <laughs> so when you hear this song on the ice cream truck, right? You know, you know what's going on. Let's see here. Uh, let's pull this up. But it, but but also if you go if you go on YouTube. And because uh, like in one of a couple of my lectures, I played uh, some of this song. Uh, in word level watermelon, ha ha ha. And, and you have to understand this stuff was commonplace, like early 1900s, things like this. Now we do it to ourselves and we get Grammy Awards for doing that. You know, imagine that we get NAACP awards uh, and get the N word all in our music. But we used to we used to fight against stuff like this. We had we used to have enough sense to protest against things like this. Now we become complicit in our own dehumanization. Uh, let me see something here. They said, okay. Let me see if I can pull it up. Now this is Turkey in the Straw. I just want you to hear the melody. You've all heard that song. So, you've all heard that song on the ice cream truck. So that's the 1942 version of Turkey in the Straw. But that song was also, that, that's an old song. That goes back to the late 1800s, something like that, Turkey in the Straw. But that was used as the melody for N-word level watermelon, ha, 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 in 1916. Okay. So, and, then, and that song is still played by, this song is still played by uh, ice cream trucks today. All right, so uh, <laughs> and this ties this ties into the history of the minstrel shows in this country. All right, so you know what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. All right. So when you start studying this history, you start studying the history of the minstrel shows going back to uh, slavery, going back to uh, 1828, 1820, by 1828, 1829, uh, T.D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice creating the uh, Jim Crow character. Um, and uh, Jim Crow character comes from the song, turn around, jump around, I jump just so every time I turn around and jump Jim Crow. And then uh, T.D. Rice being known as the father of the minstrel shows. And minstrel shows spreading all throughout the country, south and north, and becoming one of the top forms of entertainment in this country. Uh, you know, and they're lampooning and, and uh, caricatures of African Americans, dehumanizing images of African Americans, things like this. And we're going to see we're going to see this. Uh, we, we we see this come to radio when we have Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll in the 1920s create the characters of Amos and Andy, which was which was, became like the most popular radio show uh, of its time, Amos and Andy. These were two white men who um, oftentimes would perform on the radio in blackface because they would take pictures, put them in newspapers, put them in magazines, things like this. I'm an old radio show buff, so I study like the history of old radio shows, things like this. Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll created the characters of Amos and Andy. And uh, I've seen pictures of them wearing blackface doing the radio show. Okay. And then when in 1950s, when the radio show came to television, then they couldn't have white men in blackface. So they got African-Americans to portray Amos and Andy and Sapphire and Kingfish, things like this. Right. And the NAACP rightfully protested against it. You know, I think it only stayed on there a couple of seasons or something like that. They rightfully protested against it. Today, they give image awards to the TV show Empire. We used to protest against TV shows like Empire, okay? Because the, the Empire to me is like Amos and Andy. Um, it's even worse, to tell you the truth. 
But we, the NAACP used to protest against stuff like that. The NAACP led protests against the movie The Birth of a Nation in 1915, okay? Um, uh, William Monroe Trotter, when it came to Boston, he led protests. There's a documentary called um, Birth of a Movement, Birth of a Movement uh, on PBS, Independent Lands. And it's about William Monroe Trotter leading protests in 1915 against the movie The Birth of a Nation. We saw... Um, uh, uh, Charlotta, uh, Charlotta Bass out in California, um, who was uh, the, the, she was a, I think she was an editor of a newspaper and she was a member of the NAACP you, out there. They're leading protests all across the country. We're leading protests against this, uh, against this movie because this movie called Race Rides in the Streets. And if you understand the movie, The Birth of a Nation, it was based upon, um, uh, a novel called The Klansman by Reverend Thomas Dixon. And this movie glorified the Ku Klux Klan. It showed the Ku Klux Klan as being the heroes at the end of the movie, putting down a rebellion of former Negro Union soldiers because the movie takes place during slavery, the Civil War and Reconstruction, okay? To, to make a long story short, because uh, I want to get back to this main topic. The movie, The Birth of a Nation, came out in 1915, which was the 50th, 50th year anniversary of the Civil War ending, chattel slavery ending with the 13th Amendment of December 6, 1865. And all the hatred that the South had for losing the Civil War was shown in that movie. The movie show, the movie took, the, the movie takes place in Piedmont, South Carolina on the plantation of a doctor, um, Doctor, I forgot the doctor's name, but he's a he's a nice quote unquote nice slave owner. And there's a scene in the movie. The movie is a it's a silent movie. Okay, it's three hours in length. It costs a hundred thousand dollars to make the movie. Most expensive movie at the time, longest movie at the time. It's on YouTube. You can watch the entire movie. They have sub. They have uh, captions. Okay, so be prepared. It's a silent movie. Directed by D.W. Griffith. But the movie was um, it, he he used type, he used uh, filmmaking techniques and shots and things like this that had never been seen before. All right, the movie made the case really to bring slavery back because this this goes to the case that the South was making to maintain slavery. The South was saying that slavery was a system that benefited everybody. They made the case that enslaved Africans were too ignorant to take care of themselves. If you had a benevolent or nice slave master, then the enslaved Africans would become almost part of the family. And he would take care of them and provide food and clothing and shelter for them. Okay. There's a scene where they show the uh, slaves on the plantation singing and dancing and entertaining the the doctor and his family. They're sitting on the porch, the, the, the doctor and his family sitting on the porch and the little slave children and enslaved Africans are dancing and singing, entertaining them, right? This is the case that the South was making. The South was making that the, 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 the case that the, the system of slavery had a system of checks and balances. If you turn the Africans free, they will not be able to take care of themselves. They're going to be wild. And, and you're, going to have, you're going to have black men trying to rape white women. That's depicted in the film. Okay? Now, most of the characters who were supposed to be African Americans in the movie were white people in blackface. And there's a scene where they, should, they have, quote unquote, the, the big black brute trying to rape a white virgin. This movie called Rape Calls Race Rides in the Streets. This movie rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan in this country because the Ku, if you know anything about the Ku Klux Klan, the Ku Klux Klan had largely died out by 1815. The Klan was severely hurt by the 1871 um, um, Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. But by 1915, this is 50s. So the Klan is founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. Okay, it's founded... Uh, about a week after the 13th Amendment is ratified, December 18th, 1865. 
so the Klan is large. They still exist, but they're weak. They, they, they've largely died out by 1915. A lot of the early Klan members are dead. This movie rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. And the Klan becomes very powerful again in the 1920s. So around 1926, you see the Klan, they have the march um, in Washington, D.C., outside the U.S. Capitol building. The Klan becomes very powerful again because of this movie. And the movie was so powerful that in newspaper ads, in newspapers where they had ads advertising the movie, The Birth of a Nation, the Ku Klux Klan would oftentimes take out recruiting ads next to the ad of the movie, The Birth of a Nation. Because when you saw the movie poster for The Birth of a Nation, they had a Klansman on a horse in the movie, uh, on the movie poster. The, the first 30 days that the movie was out, the movie was called The Klansman. Then the name was changed to uh, Birth of a Nation. So when you when you look when you look at that, and then the, and we see the Klan, they had another rejuvenation during the um, the Civil Rights era, during like the fifties and sixties, things like that. But but the movie The Birth of a Nation was a significant movie in the history of this country. All right, so uh, so check out. Uh, the, the article from NPR.org, recall the ice cream truck song. Okay, check that out. We got Carla, Lisa, how's everybody doing? Laura, um, what else is here? So uh, let's go back to the article here. Five African foods you thought were American. Five African foods you thought were American. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we found out that watermelon dates back 5,000 years ago. Right. A lot of people didn't notice. OK, so <laughs> there's a reason why African-Americans like watermelon. OK, is an ancient African food. OK, let me post this article right here. The 5000 year secret history of watermelon There's a reason why African-Americans like watermelon. It's an ancient African food. OK, so let's uh, let's go back to the uh, previous article here. Let me back up. All right, so uh, we've talked about cola nuts. We talked about okra, and then um, a watermelon also. Okay, so when we look at, um, okay, now scholars scholars debate exactly uh, scholars debate where exactly on the continent watermelon came from, but it was cultivated widely in ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet where it was buried in Pharaoh's tombs to provide hydration for their journeys to the afterlife. So when we look at black eyed peas, also known as cow peas, cow peas, C-O-W-P-E-A-S, um, we find cow peas coming from Central and Southern Africa. Now, uh, black eyed peas, cow peas are high in protein with leaves that are rich in minerals. Black eyed peas grow quickly, suppress weeds and improve yields of other crops. The legumes were used as a provision on slave ships and later also used to feed livestock in the U.S., hence the alternate name cow pea, C-O-W-P-E-A, cow pea, black eye or cow peas. Black eye peas are associated now with New Year's Day in the American South and are a key ingredient in Hoppin' John, a dish made with greens and pork that symbolizes good luck. So I read a number of articles that talked about this Hoppin' John because I had never heard of Hoppin' John before now. I, I don't, I haven't had meat in going on like 12 years. Um, let's see, been veteran since 2000, 5, 2005, 2000, 15 years, okay? So I, I had never heard of Hoppin' John. Now we look at coffee, okay? Coffea Arabica, okay? Uh, which comes from Ethiopia. Many people associate coffee with South America. But, quote, Ethiopia is the birthplace of the world's premier coffee, uh, said uh, Judith Carney. Legend has it that a goat, a goat herder named Kalbi, K-A-L-B-I, discovered it when his herd became particularly boisterous after eating berries from a tree. Whether that's true or not, quote, how to take a coffee bean, know when and how to roast it, 
and turn it into a delicious beverage involve a deep cultural knowledge system of growing and brewing varieties from the Ethiopian highlands where it originated, end quote, said uh, Judith Carney. Now, when Europeans reached East Africa, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and the uh, Emirates in the 16th uh, century, they encountered coffee houses and culture around the drink. But given the racial prejudice against Africans honed during the transatlantic slave trade and the fact that coffee had become so central to Muslim culture, Europeans attributed the art of making the drink and the profusion of coffee houses to Muslim societies. Now, Judith Carney says in her book, quote, the popular image of Africa today is of a hungry continent, yet it's because of, Africa, of African crops and enslaved Africans uh, or, or, or the, uh, enslaved agricultural practices that we eat what and how we do in America, okay? It's because of African crops and because of the agricultural practices of African slaves that we eat what and how we do in America. So this is another way that Africa has profited, that, that America has profited from Africa and has profited from the transatlantic slave trade. It's not just from the African bodies, it's not just from the labor, but it's also the foods from Africa that have come to America and have become American as well. Okay, so check out this article. Um, as well, five African foods you thought were American from uh, National Geographic. All right, let's see who we have here. Okay, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast. Follow us on our uh, YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Uh, follow us on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All of my DVD lectures are there. If you like this type of information, all of my DVD lectures are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, our latest uh, bundle pack is the Black Migration 1619 to 2019 um, six lecture bundle pack. We have it in digital download format and DVD format as well. Uh, so it's uh, on sale $45 and $50. So we just posted that link, check that out also. And all of my, I have about 45 of my lectures uh, at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, okay? Uh, listen to the African History Network show every Sunday, 9 p.m., 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, WFDF. Don't I have a voice for uh, radio? That's what everybody tells me, right? So we, uh, so this year I'm celebrating my 10th year in radio. And let's uh, see, March 10th, 2020, will be 10 years of doing the African History Network show. And April of 2020 will be four years of doing the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF in Detroit. Um, if you like this type of information, you can also donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And um, also uh, through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. We posted a link here. Um, and at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, click on the yellow donate button as well, okay? All right, so all of our shows are uh, podcasted. Um, let's see, our January 5th, 2020 show is uh, in audio podcast format also. So when you go to africanhistorynetwork.com, click on the link, listen to podcasts. We're on eight different podcast platforms, wherever, so wherever you get your podcast from, whether it's CastBox, iTunes, Stitcher, FM Player, TuneIn, Radio, just search for the African History Network show, the African History Network show. And uh, when you go to uh, Blog Talk, if you go to our website, click on the link, uh, listen to podcasts, it takes you to our Blog Talk Radio page, blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show. We have about a thousand audio podcasts there going back to 2010. Okay, so I've been doing this for a minute. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see some more of your comments here before we get out of here. Let's see, we got Audrey. Okay, how you doing, Audrey? uh thanks for the enlightenment we've got uh laura okay so it's very educational and enlightening all right good good this is a lot of work okay we've got carla lisa nathaniel 
uh, and I'm going to do a, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have to do a separate uh, broadcast, really dealing with the history of um, watermelon. Okay, dealing with the history of watermelon and how watermelon became uh, negative, how watermelon became a racist trope for African Americans. This is a deep history because it. It, we grew watermelons on our own land that we owned after slavery and became a sense of independence for us as well. Okay. But that's another presentation. All right. And, uh, okay. Sherwin, uh, let's see here. All right. Okay. So yeah, listen to the African history network show every Sunday, 9 PM, 11 PM Eastern standard time. And if you want me to do a presentation for a group of, group or organization, email me at customer service at African history network.com customer service at African history network.com. Okay. Whether it's for Dr. King day, whether it's for February African American history month, we know that's coming up. Um, email me at customer service at African history network.com and we can make that happen. All right. Now in 2020, a lot of people want to get their credit straight and triple R credit services and Chandra Net Middleton can help you with this. Are you tired of having poor credit? Are you tired of paying those high double digit interest rates? Would you like to purchase your dream home one day? If the answer is yes to any of these questions, then RRR credit services is your answer. RRR credit services is your one stop when it comes to credit education and repair. They equip you by providing solutions solutions, which will enable you to rebuild your financial future. The, uh, the affordable cost to become a new client is just $30 for the first month. Take the first step by giving them a call at 1-800-607-1989, 1-800-607-1989 for a free credit consultation. Don't delay and begin your triple R score program today. You can also visit their website, rrrcreditservices.com and it'll be either Chandra Nett or one of her uh, staff that uh, will help you with this and let them know you found out about this from the African History Network. All right, guys, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember that. Remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. Remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.